Ma täna on Eesti kerjaatrite seltsi nimel Eesti Arstide liitu, kes see kordsetel Eesti Arstide päevadel andis meile võimaluse rääkida eakate probleemidest. Ja kui tavaliselt oleme me rääkinud nii ütelda puhtalt kerjaatrilistest sündroomidest, siis see kord tegime veidi erineva programmi ja kui meie seltsil on 22 liiget praegu, mis on Eestis ilmselt üks väiksemaid eriala seltse, siis meil on palju koostööpartnereid, on palju arste ja teadlasi, kes on kerjaatritega koostööd teinud ja sellepärast me otsustasime tänase programmi panna kokku ka nendest saavutustest, mis eakate elu ja toimetulekut mõjutavad. Ja Eesti kerjaatrite seltsil on ka arvukalt väliskontakte. Me oleme üle kümne aasta nii UEMSI liige kerjaatria seksioonis kui Euroopa kerjaatrilise meditsiini ühingu liige kui maailma gerontoloogia ja kerjaatria assotsiatsiooni liige. Ja nii saan ma praegu sisse juhatada meie esimest põnelejat, kes tuleb Prantsusmaalt, Grenobli Alpi ülikoolist ja põhjus just teda kutsuda oli eelkõige see, et tegemist on rahvusvaheliselt väga tuntud teadlasega, kelle taustaks on nii geriaatria kui infektsioonhaigused. Ta on olnud geriaatria professor Grenoblis alates 2011. aastast. Töötab väga paljudes ekspertgruppides, neid on üle neljakümne kaasa arvatud Euroopa geriaatria ühingu infektsioonhaiguste grupis. On teinud väga palju uuringuid infektsioonidest eakatel ja tema publikatsioonide arv nendel teemadel on augartust äratav. Lisaks on ta väga hea kõneleja, nii et ma olin tõesti väga õnnelik, kui ta kutse Eestisse tulla vastu võttis. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest lecturer, Professor Kvetan Kavatsi from France. Welcome. Ah, first words. Tanante it, et min kutsut sitte. So, it's my only word in Estonian, and I apologize about that. Uh, so, I will try to, to make you uh, a small travel uh, and as clearly as possible around vaccination in uh, aging population. But uh, this is my disclosure of interest, but my main my main uh, conflict of interest is with my parents, in fact, but don't worry, it's arranged now. Um, first in preamble, I would like to say to you, because I, I know that geriatric is coming and it's raising now, and I think you, you have to be aware of that. It begins a uh, few uh, years ago in France, and it's, it's only two years ago that we have 200 specific fellow uh, for geriatrics. We have not a lot of uh, uh, physician in France, less per inhabitants than in, uh, than in, uh, in Estonia. But nearly we have now 4,000 geriatricians. Uh, we have one uh, yearly congress with 1,800 uh, participants. And the specialty, as I said, is a full specialty from 2017 only now. Uh, the topic of aging population, uh, geriatric, is acute care, rehabilitation, of course, geriatric assessment, but also, I think, something very important, which has already begun for a long time in Estonia. It's to share in between specialty the, uh, the capacities of geriatrician to think differently uh, 
take the pathology, but not pathology only, multimorbidities and the morbidities at functional level, which I will uh, uh, deal, uh, deal with and say something later on. And the main things for geriatrician, of course, and when I said sharing, it's autogeriatrics and co-geriatrics. The main thing is to pre the prevention, and the, perhaps the main thing is pre prevention of disability. The second panel be before uh, discussing about old vaccination is to keep in mind something very important when, uh, when we talk about vaccination. Uh, at individual level, the decision to be vaccinated or not is the perception for the individual to have to balance in between the disease and the complication of the disease in front of the vaccine and the complication of the vaccine. This is finally quite simple if it's well explained. But we have to keep in mind that at collective level, because there are also pitfalls and goals of vaccination at collective levels, uh, and you know that if the population aging, it's because in part of vaccination in childhood uh, and because of vaccine policies about that. But actually, the question is not only to take individual interest uh, at individual level, but also collective interest. And the collective interest is now based on cost effectiveness analysis. This is of importance to keep this in mind because it explains how it's very highly variable, and I will show you uh, further how the policies from a state to another state is different, even though we have some recommendation at, uh, at European level. So to sum up, I will give you some element about what is healthy aging, perhaps active, it's the new word. After we will go from uh, for free, uh, free vaccine preventable disease, which is flu, pneumococcal infection, and zoster. I cannot do everything, but for this one, I will try to give you how we can uh, um, decide to vaccinate or not in between the disease and the vaccine efficiency meaning that we need to know very good, very well the disease if we want to measure the efficacy of the vaccine. And this could be a problem, you will see. And finally, uh, we will discuss about vaccine policies and how it's variable and if there are some evidence. So the general concept of healthy aging is the result of the individual perception individual perception, it's quite important, of his own, a own aging for the definition of well-being and health. At uh, the WHO decided to write it now like that. Healthy aging is a process. It's a process. It's not a status. It's a process of optimizing opportunities for phys physical, social, and mental, mental health to enable older uh, people to take part, an active part in the society and to be independent and to be enjoyed of this, their quality of life. What are the determinants of that? When I, uh, uh, when I am at medical school in the first year uh, of medical school, I explained to the, to the student that unfortunately, if they want to uh, be more involved in the healthy aging. You don't have to take care about diseases or biological aging because the major determinant are social, environmental, economics, spirituality, and family psychological. But my work is to be a doctor, so I take care of disease. Look, but keep in mind this, the determinant of the main determinant of healthy aging are not disease, are not genetics, are not biological aging. It takes part, of course, and we will try, we will try to reverse something and I will try to explain to you how. The second thing, when you put all this, uh, all this together, is that, of course, aging is a process, 
its universal, universal intrinsic and progressive and, and somehow deleterious, but not completely deleterious. But the main characteristic, it's a heterogeneity. And uh, left up, you have the first man who climbed the Everest mountain up after 80 years old. I have in my consultation and made several 80 plus person who climb mountain faster than me. And I have a performance of people for, of um, 40 years old around. So it means that this, these several guys which are uh, in my consultation uh, are 80 plus, but in fact, physiologically, they are in between 40 and 50 years old. But at the same time, as you can see in uh, down, uh, we have some people who is 70 or 80 or 85, which are already disabled. Uh, but it's in reality, it's fewish. If you look in France, it's less than 20% of 80 plus who live with disability uh, in, uh, in at home. So. If we take the picture, of course, this is my uncle on the left, 90 years old, from healthy, quite healthy. It's simple to see. It's really simple to, to see that he is quite fit. I don't know if you try. Try, it's difficult. And uh, on the uh, right, it's another member of the family, but it's pathologic and disabled. Activity daily life, it's difficult. This is really simple. And it's simple to, to have very good decision, medical decision, ethics for all of, of this. But the problem is in between, because it's a process. And how we can recognize the people who are frail, in fact. Frail, what does it mean? I can speak about, uh, I think, two or three days about frailty, so it's quite difficult to say in few words. But perhaps you will uh, recognize them. Unfortunately, we recognize them afterwards. It means that when they came to the hospital or to the consultation, there is one trigger, flu, a trauma or something. And when they stay at hospital, they have many numerous unexpected complications, iatrogenic events, healthcare associated infection, nosocomial falls, malnutrition, pressure sores, delirium, all these things lead to something that we found in any words in the world would take care of person 75 plus or 80 plus. It means disability. And disability is cost. It is the most important things you uh, give in France at least money to, uh, to be able to take care of disabled person. It's more than social security uh, resources. But why? Finally, why they became disabled? A lot of people said about uh, Iman senescence. I, can, I cannot go throughout Iman senescence, but I, I put this here to have in mind that uh, there is a a kind of normal aging. I don't like normal aging because I think it, it's, uh, we, we don't know what is normal aging, but usual aging, it's much for what happened now, what we know now about uh, uh, physiological aging. And in between successful aging and pathological uh, aging, we see that there are a real decrease in naive T cells, naive B cells, a long, in uh, uh, a long increase, uh, a big increase in senescence T cells, and uh, finally an, inflama an inflammatory status. And all these things means that you are more susceptible to infection, but perhaps no common infection, but viral infection, and prob probably you have less uh, vaccine response, which is Perhaps the main thing we can find in immune senescence is the decrease in, uh, in vaccine response. This perhaps is the perfect disease to say how 
there is a link in between senescence and uh, immune senescence and the disease. You will see after. There here it's to see that uh, in between 40 and 50 years old, you have a real decrease in the management of VZV uh, infection, VZV vi virus finally, which are in your spinal ganglia. Uh, and when this tolerance decreases, this Lymphocy lymphocytic activities against VZV decrease, you increase the risk of zoster. And you will see that we have the opposite uh, picture uh, when you look at the epidemiological data about VZV infection in the aging process. The second is uh, to see how immune senescence and response to pneumococcal vaccine, here it's conjugate vaccine seven valences and polysaccharide uh, pneumococcal vaccine 23 valence and uh, see how there is a, a clear link and it explains nearly 70 to 80 percent of the variability of the response in between the frailty status that I told you before and uh, and the response to uh, to the vaccine meaning that more you are frail, less you answer to the vaccine, at least this one. However, however, when you look at tetanus, when you look at pertussis, and you look at the immunological uh, response to this antigen, it works quite well. It works nearly perfectly. Nearly as if you are 80, as you are 40 as you are 20. Meaning that the figure we have in mind taking or uh, what you say about hymen senescence and the link in between hymen senescence and hymen response to vaccine is not perfectly clear, finally. So vaccine response at aging, biomarker are different, varying varying from vaccine to a vaccine and from a disease to another disease. So we have no strict correlation in between biomarker, biomarker of aging, of course, because we have not, and clinics. And this limitate the, our understanding and the reason for lower efficiency of vaccine. Not efficacy, immunological efficacy, but efficiency, meaning the clinical efficacy of a vaccine. Oh, I'm sorry, it doesn't work. The idea here is to say that if we can uh, have a booster earlier in life, in between 40, 50, 60, and because before immune senescence arrive, we can have a better control of all these vaccine preventable disease for long term. So it means that if we uh, manage a program, not only a vaccine program, not only for very old population where the vaccine works less. If we begin earlier, we can imagine that we will have enough uh, activity to prevent disease later or to boost again later more efficiency. So my first take on Mason about uh, healthy aging but you understand it's that biological and medical factor. It's better. It means that you have less disease, less chronic disease, less acute disease, less disability, there is a, a, a real link, and finally, less immune senescence. But we have to take in, uh, uh, to, to keep in mind that, it's why geriatricians are, are there, it's that we have no biomarker of the aging process. And the geriatric global assessment give the opportunity to a, uh, an expert like a geriatrician to say, this guy is like a guy of 45 or 60, or this guy is of 65, is in fact a guy of 85. We have no biomarker. I know that physiolo physiological age is uh, is warranted by all over specialties, but we have no uh, means, only geriatrician for that. So now we will go further uh, with all the, the three main v, VPD, pneumococcus, influenza, and zoster. 
to better understand how we can have, uh, I would say, an influence or a vaccine efficiency or to measure ef efficacy really, we have to uh, know which is the disease and how the disease is spreading or not, which are the consequences of a disease. So about influenza, we are going, and I will give also in the same way the European recommendation. First, here you can see a uh, free picture where uh, we measure in France uh, the activities of flu uh, from uh, 2013 to 2018. And all the peaks you see are the peak in ambulatory on left, on hospitalization uh, on the right, and ICU admission, and finally, uh, the number of nursing home uh, outbreaks. What you can see is from a year to another year, it's quite different, but much more interesting is that it's not because you have a very big activity in ambulatory, in ambulatory uh, consultation in primary care, you have the same thing in hospitalization, meaning that influenza consequences in uh, children, in adults, or in older population vary lo a lot of in between uh, a season to another season. And it could be very, uh, it could be a, a very big outbreak in ambulatory with a lot of consultation, but rare or less severe disease. And finally, you can see in nursing home that each year we have nearly 1,000, in between 300 and 1,000 outbreaks. And I will gi give you some data further. This is to say that between area, between settings, and between each year you have a very uh, different figure of influenza. What about death? Usually, uh, this is the presentation of the CDC about usual presentation of CDC, and they said usually you have in between uh, uh, 140 to 700, uh, 700,000 hospitalization, and uh, the death rate is in between 12,000 and uh, a bit more than 50,000. This is the data for from 30, 40 years. But last year, in between, in 2017 and 2018, the, the last winter season, it was more than 80,000. They said it's in an incredible uh, uh, season. But in, in Europe, it was better than 2014, and I will show you after. So it means that in the area, it changed, and it could change uh, a lot. What about influenza-related death at European level? It's in between flu alone. So I can discuss further if you have questions how we calculate that. But uh, the excess death during winter, which is not lonely uh, flu, but mainly flu, it's in between 50,000 50, and 200,000. I think it's a very huge I don't know how many diseases can, can give this, this data. And only during a winter period, which is really defined from uh, eight to 12 weeks. Imagine what happened. Influenza epidemiology in France. Here you have uh, nearly 30 peaks, and the 30 peaks each peak it's a season, and in 2014-2015, they said in at, at TV, perhaps TV today, I will say that, uh, in Estonia, but uh, they said it's a very, very incredible, incredible uh, winter with a lot of death, and in fact, we have uh, 18,000 excess death in uh, for influenza this year. Then, when you look at the data, it was over 30 years, the 13th peak only. Meaning that 
you say it's incredible, but it was not. It was usual. It was the same last year and this year, fortunately, it's only 10,000 excess deaths in France. And mainly, it's people more than 75 years old. Uh, the same to say how, how it's difficult to measure. We have a very good public health ministry in France. They give the data I present to you. The same, the same year, in another way, uh, with death certificates, they give all, uh, all the disease associated, uh, associated death. And I present you the uh, infection related death and the rate in, in adults and on, on left and in uh, 85 plus on the right. When you look at that, finally, they can publish in the same year that we have more than 14,000 excess death during winter, mainly due to, uh, to the flu. And here, to say that we have only 700, 700 uh, deaths in another way. And it's because they calculate on death certificate. I don't know here if people re write flu after two weeks of hospitalization for a flu, if somebody on the death certificate will re write flu. I said 10 years ago that I didn't do that. Now I did, even if uh, the people die 15 days, 13 days after, or more than one month, because the trigger is here, it's flu. So my word is, is it, is it really serious to do like this? But what I show you about France, it's the same in all of the world. The calculation is complicated, and finally we have no idea really of the flu-related uh, death. So be careful. We know that it's a lot of, but we don't know really how many. So we have to see if there is an, uh, an impact. Why? Here, some data, and I will go uh, faster, but there is a real indirect impact of flu on other disease. Now we know very clearly that there is an association between the flu peaks and the infarctus, myocardial infarctus peaks in the winter period. We know that there is some stroke and we have a, a kind of outbreak of stroke in elderly population after the winter season. Just a, just a, a delay of 10 to 15 days. And it's quite demonstrated all over the world, and each year, just to see to show you that it's a twofold increase. After f during flu season, you have a twofold increase of myocardial infection and strokes. But much more important, I said to you that uh, a part of the healthy aging is not to become disabled. And here we have few data, but we are now free from the last uh, 20 years. We know that. Uh, the impact of flu on activity daily life score is quite important because, as you see on the Gozalo, uh, Gozalo uh, studies and the uh, Barker studies published earlier, you have uh, around 25% to 30% of people, if they don't die, of course a lot of die, but if they don't die in 80 plus population, you will find that uh, one out of four or one out of three will have, will become disabled, which is important at individual level. Not able to, to go to toilet alone, not able to stand up, not able to walk 10 meters, not able to wash yourself. I think it's at individual level, it's quite important. But if you cannot, understand that at individual level. Imagine what happened at collective level. It's an enormous cost. This uh, last week uh, in France there is an expert 
uh, records uh, that say that the emergency in health care system is to take care of disability which will explode in the few years because of the explosion uh, of the demography of uh, aging population, uh, very old population. And the data we had now, it's a prospective study where about s one, more than 100 flu laboratory confirm uh, we follow, more than 30% of them would, we didn't die, we didn't die, F three months after are still disabled because of flu. So it means that uh, it's a real great impact. So now we know, we know that we have a real num number of arguments to say flu is a real tsunami for age, p age population. So is the vaccine is good? I would say no, it's not good. Because as you can see uh, on, on, on the back, it's less, it decreases only 30% lethal complication. It reduced only 50% of virologically uh, lab confirmed flu. So it's not a lot. It's not a very good medication. But now think, it's for thousand, thousand millions of European age population, meaning with one shot meaning that it's more efficient than all cardiovascular medicine. And I apologize if there are some cardiologists in the, uh, in the assembly, but it's much more important and more efficient than statins and all of these pills that you have to take every day. If we talk about vaccine, we have to talk about efficiency, but we have to talk about also adverse drug reaction. And this is the good news. For age population, it's quite clear for all vaccine, I will say, that here, vaccine versus placebo, there's very little uh, adverse drug reaction. So Often, local uh, adverse drug re reaction and very rare uh, general signs meaning that we have at individual level a real benefit and a very uh, low adver uh, risk. So the European consensus of uh, all the infectiologist society, geriatric society and specialized uh, IMUN society say that, of course, yearly, even though we are not uh, a, num a number of data, yearly influenza vaccination is recommended for each people who is more than 65. We move now from standard dose or trivalent or quadrivalent to a high dose uh, inactivated influenza because we have uh, last year uh, this, this data, meaning that when you uh, use the high dose versus the standard dose, you are really more efficient and really uh, we have good data. Less than 20, 24%, it's quite important. As I, to remember you, it's 30% activities with standard dose. If it's more active, it means that we can reach 40 to 50% activities uh, efficiency. So if we have to keep in mind something about flu, we have to vaccine all 65 plus with a high dose uh, of flu vaccine and much more quadrivalent. What about pneumococcus? Pneumonia in older, is it frequent? I don't know what you, are in, uh, uh, what you have in your age, but if you took very young old population of 65 plus in front of 85, 80, 80 plus, you have a tenfold increase in community in healthcare associated pneumonia and in pneumonia uh, acquired in nursing home. We have a lot of nursing home in France, around 10,000. 
meaning that we have nearly 800,000 people in nursing home, 80 plus. And the life expectancy is nearly uh, three years to four years. Uh, the main reason to die in nursing home is pneumonia. As you can see in France, there are very few uh, incidents to the prospective study about that. When you are in a nursing home and you are 80 plus, you have one risk out of five in the year to get a pneumonia. When you get a pneumonia, you have the risk to be died in the several month, in the year. You have a short, higher short mortality, meaning that it's in between, I said, 7% uh, to 26% in the in the in the 30 following days of the uh, of the pneumonia but look in the uh, in the left up left uh, graph you can see that there is a long term impact of pneumonia increasing the risk of death during one year meaning that at the end if you live in nursing home and you get a pneumonia you have one risk out of two to be died at the end of a year. That is a lot. And again, because uh, aging, healthy aging is also age without disability, is, the question is, is pneumonia, if you don't die, is pneumonia uh, leads to uh, disability? And it's true. Uh, the same for flu. One out of four, one out of three will become disabled after pneumonia and will stay with his disability during the rest of his life. Again, the impact is very high. So what are, what are the, the vaccines? Here we have two. We have a pneumococcal vaccine, polysaccharide, PPV23, and the PCV, P, PCV conjugate vaccine, 13, 13 serotypes. What we can say about that is when you compare at immunological response, the conjugate vaccine is better. Better uh, antibody response. There is a, cell, a T cells, uh, memory T cells response. There is a mucosal response, meaning that you can imagine that you will decrease also the, trans the cross transmission in, in between. And there is a very good tolerance for the both. So I would say, what, what is the better? For polysaccharide uh, 20, uh, 23 uh, valences, so we have uh, a lot of data and we can reach a meta-analysis that saying that uh, at the end, less than 40% of pneumonia are decreased in any kind of people. If you go just under, you, you can see that prevention in nursing home, only one study, but the one study, it was a, a randomized controlled trial in nursing home in Japan. They proved that there was a decrease of 30% of all cause pneumonia when you use the polysaccharide vaccine. So it means it works. It's not a very good vaccine, but it works. But when you look, at the vaccine coverage in Europe, there is no study in Estonia, and you will explain further why. Uh, in France, it's a PT. It's in between 10 and 20% coverage. You see, it's a very severe disease, lot of mortality, lot of complication, lot of disability, and finally, we don't use it. it and it's quite everywhere the same unless United Kingdom, which, uh, which is quite over. So they tried to make uh, a very big study. It was in Netherlands, it was several years ago, and they published that the use in community in 65 plus the conjugate vaccine. And here the results are there. It's, it's better. It's not largely better, but it's better. It seems better. It's not comparative, so be careful. We cannot say directly. But the result of the RCT is in favor 
of using uh, the PCV13 in community uh, elderly po po dwelling population. The side effects are very few, so when you look which kind of thing we can do. So the senior strategy proposed by ECMID, IGMS, and Wided is if you are not vaccinated in, uh, at 65, you need to be vaccinated with the conjugate vaccine. And after one year, in between eight weeks and one year, you have to receive the pneumococcal uh, polysaccharide vaccine, 23 valences. If you have not the PCV13 available in your country, you need to use the PPC, PPV23 in any patient who are up to 70, 75. And for adult strategy under 65 or in between 65 and 75, there is a discussion in a high risk based strategy. But when you, when you make like that, the real thing is does it work everywhere? In fact, in the analysis in France, the analysis in Germany at the cost effectiveness analysis discuss because they don't use the same data, say that in Germany we don't need the PCV13. And in France they said uh, we use the PCV13 but not for all older population. Particularly we have no data in 85 plus because the data of a New England, New England Journal of Medicine publication have not enough 85 plus in the, in, in, in the study. So we cannot conclude. If you cannot conclude, French government say, we don't pay for them. I call it ageism, even though strictly, scientifically, if we are strict, they are, they are true. What about zoster? Zoster is a benign disease for every, everybody. But what happened? If you look on the, uh, on the left side, you can see that uh, up to 50, there is a very huge increase in the incidence of zoster. This leads to the fact that nearly half of the zoster uh, infection or zoster will, will get after 60 years, more than 50%. Zoster is, of course, a benign disease, but not in old population. Why? Because in old population, when you're getting older and older, you uh, increase the chance to have post herpetic neuralgia. And post herpetic neuralgia, it's less, it's about 30% of people, one month age uh, of 80 plus, uh, after one month, mon one month after the zoster meaning that uh, neuropathic neuralgia, I don't know if you experiment it, but now we have uh, real good data to say that there is a real impact on the functional, uh, functionality of a, of a people, dressing, eating, mobility, anxiety, on psychological impact, a physical impact, and finally a social impact. And this is true for people who work but it's true also for very old population. So it means that if we have a vaccine which can decrease uh, the incidence, it's perfect, but if we have a vaccine which decreases also the post-herpetic neuralgia or the impact of post-herpetic neuralgia on physical ability or disability, it's, it would be perfect. Uh, there is one. This one is now available for 15 years. And it was the same vaccine than used uh, for children. There was only because it's a live attenuate vaccine, it's contradicted in immunodeficiency uh, population. And you don't need to know if you are, uh, uh, if you experiment uh, chickenpox before or not. There is very low, very low uh, adverse drug reaction. And what is the benefit we can know? So again, 
no or very rare adverse drug reaction, only one out of 10,000 for a new chickenpox. What about the efficacy? As you can see, there is a decrease, uh, very good decrease in incidence about for all uh, population eight, uh, 50 plus, a decrease of 50% of the incidence of per herpes zoster. Uh, you have a decrease in post herpetic neura neuralgia, PA chain, of more than 60%. And finally, there is if you experiment a zoster vaccine and you have post herpetic neuralgia, you have still an impact of the vaccine to preserve your uh, capacity, functional capacities. This is the global picture for 50 plus. What about uh, the very old population? And as you can see, that the vaccine didn't work very well uh, in 80 plus. On the right side, you can see that it protects only one person out of five. So it's not a lot. But look about the post-herpetic neuralgia. It's nearly the same. It protects four person out of 10 who experiment zoster. And for person who experiment zoster, finally, they preserve the capacity and they decrease the impact on functional ability of the zoster for people who are, age, who are more than 80 plus. Meaning that it's not, it's not nothing. But if you are an economist, you say, it's too expensive to protect this kind of people with uh, such vaccine which work not, not so much. It means that the consensus of herpes zoster uh, vaccination from ECMID, from a UGMS, said you have to, from the data we have, at individual level for sure, you have to use it with uh, live attenuate zoster for uh, old per person who are uh, more than 50 years old. No revaccination, and we, have, we are wi waiting now for new vaccine, which are really, and Zoe uh, 50 and Zoe 70, demonstrate a very uh, huge uh, activity, efficiency, and perhaps it will be in Europe available, not this year, but uh, the, in 2020, because it decreased uh, the incidence of zoster about 90%, but we have one already. We are waiting for this, the second, but the, 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 the one we have is not used. And what about when you say uh, uh, which kind of cost I, have, I want to, to give to, for, for zoster, to prevent zoster? In fact, in France, we decided uh, because of cost-effectiveness analysis, to use, is, to use it only in between 65 and 74. When you are a doctor, it's pneumococcal vaccine in France is high risk, so you have to learn about 10 risk by heart. Uh, after for zoster, you have to say it's in between 65 and 74, and for another, and for chill old, it's different. In front of that, the uptake is less than 1%, meaning that there is no a real political willingness to implement such vaccine. At the opposite, in the UK, they recommended the strategy up to 70 years. And they said they finance it, they reimburse it, they reimburse it completely, and they ask and they give some, uh, uh, some gifts to the, um, uh, to the, uh, to the physician who give the shot, and in one year, they begin to 0% and increase to more than 60%. Meaning that when, when you have a real political willingness, you can really increase the vaccine coverage. But still, there is a very uh, large difference. So, the take home message on that, for uh, European society, it's diphtheria tetanus. We, we need uh, for all uh, 65 plus. Influenza each year, pneumococcus, it's PCV 13 and PPV uh, 23. 
Zoster is for all 50 plus. And for Pertussis, we decided to say that it depends on the level of outbreak in the country. And it's at national level that you have to decide to implement vaccine, uh, Pertussis vaccine for older adults. Yes, it's true. But we have not enough efficacy for measure uh, VPD and we have to still too low vaccine coverage. And what we, and I think you experiment it as I experiment it, we have a lot of nosocomial transmission. Influences in between 10 and 20% of flu are acquired in, uh, in the hospital. So the question is the air immunity. The air immunity, there is one example. Air immunity meaning that we cannot protect people who cannot answer to the well to the vaccine if we don't present the microorganism to the, to the patient, he will not get it. Meaning that nosocomial transmission is due to healthcare workers. So we propose to have uh, to healthcare workers to getting flu shot. And we have three studies. Three studies in nursing home proving, demonstrating that you decrease mortality whatever uh, the patient, the resident in nursing home is vaccinated or not. We have very good data for that. Unless that when you look at the coverage of flu vaccination in healthcare worker is less than 30%. So there is, there is a solution in the United States we decided to transform in uh, the recommendation of flu vaccination in some states, we decided to transform it in mandatory vaccination. And look, it works quite well. More than 95% of FK workers are, uh, are protected now, but it's mandatory. And the question is open. I can uh, answer to your question if you want about that because there are a lot of work about that to see if it's uh, ethics or not for healthcare worker, to see if it's ethics for, uh, uh, for patient. And now, very fast, what is the evidence of the importance of vaccine policies? What I said, it's, uh, we have very different recommendation in, di in different EU member states. So what is, for example, flu, it's quite simple. No, it's not simple. It's not simple. See, the recommendation for some it's 50, for some over it's 55, some over is 60, and the over in blue it's 65. <laughs> we have a European recommendation, but at national level, we change everything. Why, I don't know at this level. And for healthcare worker, what, and when you change and we modify these things, what happened? People don't trust in, in data, finally. And what happened? And finally, I'm sorry to present that. But you have a country where there is a less flu vaccination rate. Perhaps there is no flu in, in Estonia. I'm not sure. Uh, but the problem is, for, from my point of view, the real decrease of vaccine coverage uh, in uh, uh, European Union states, but perhaps we, we have to begin already, <laughs> but there is a real decrease actually. For the, uh, from the time of 2009, there is a real decrease. And in France, we were at a time nearly 70%, and 70% is quite the goal that the WHO uh, ask for each state to reach, it's a target 75%. 75%, we were quite near in 2008, and finally, actually, we were less than uh, 50%. There are many, many determinants to explain that, and I can say further that we have to fight against that, because for the last three years, we experiment an increased mortality rate, an increased disability population 
after uh, after flu season. It's a, uh, it's possible that also vaccination, but we have no data on that. But vaccination decrease the overcrowding in emergency room during uh, during winter. But we have no data. But it it could be logical. This to say that uh, we need to inform and to be sure that uh, uh, the uh, public health policy is important. So there is a, there is a work of a Zux uh, a Switzerland uh, uh, team um, of public health to say what should uh, and look for the impact of each policy to see which is the best policy to implement uh, flu vaccination and to getting to increase vaccine coverage. And you have a list of everything. What you can say, what you can see here, it's there is no only one things to do. And this is the message, the principal message. If you want really to uh, overcome or to increase the, uh, the vaccine coverage for flu at least, you need to associate many things together. Here it's uh, objective, monitoring objective, uh, incentive and reimbursement. People are not getting vaccinated if they are not reimbursed. They are not, if a physician is not, ends, there is no incentive uh, thing, they will not get the flu shot to the patient. And finally, you need information. You need all these things. Well, all these things, who is deal, who's dealing with that? It's all stakeholders. The, the principal one, the main one is political. So, and my time is going out, so I will go to my take home message and the last one. It's, you have to keep in mind that infectious disease and particularly va vaccine preventable disease decreases dramatically healthy aging through mortality, but this is not so bad. When you are dead, you are dead. But through the things that it leads to disability. And we have some data to say that vaccine decreased direct and indirect short and long term mortality associated with VPD in aging population. But only one vaccine decreased really disability because it has been studied, but for over it has not been studied. Zoster vaccine is the only vaccine which leads to decrease the impact of zoster on disability. And finally, I would like to say that vari variable policies leads to no policies. And finally, we need a strong political willingness to put together all the stakeholders, you, me, patient, social media, surveillance system to increase all these things to get better for elderly population. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the excellent lecture. Nüüd on võimalus esitada küsimusi eesti keeles, inglise keeles, prantsuse keeles. Kui kas soovid? Ja seda võimalust ei teki enam vaheajal, sest meie lektoril on homme järgmine üritus Pariisis mõte lahkub kohe praegu siit tõmmi välja. I would like to point the message we were talking previously that it's not that much prevention of flu, for example, but it's much more prevention of disability than prevention of death in very elderly. If, if to be somehow very, very not so open-minded, you could say that very old people might die. But it's much more about disability, about uh, resources. Do you agree? Yeah, completely. As I said, uh, the main goal uh, for a geriatrician is not to prevent death at all, but it's to uh, transform 
an aging process which is difficult to live in an aging process quite enjoy to live. And disability is one of the f main factors uh, to, uh, to bring you in, uh, in a bad aging process. So if you have uh, in your tool book, toolbox something that can prevent disability, you need to, to use it. And I think it's uh, really things. And Zoster vaccine, Pneumococcal vaccine, I'm sure, but even it's not demonstrated for a pneumococcal vaccine, and flu, for sure, will decrease the disability associated with the disease. Uh, from the side of Estonian uh, Society of Geriatrics, I would like to thank you once again. And our gift is by Arvo Pert. Even if I lose everything, Arvo Pert is our most famous composer. Ah, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. Wow. It's in French. Uh, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. See you. Nii, täna on kõiki sessiooni kuulajaid. Nüüd on võimalus rääkida Eesti keeles poole tunni vältel ja järgmised keriaatrite korraldatud loengud heade lektorite esituses algavad kell 13.15.15. Aitäh!